1. To become intelligent, surround yourself with intelligent people. To become smart, surround yourself with smart people. If you consider yourself intelligent, then being around smart individuals will only sharpen your wit. Likewise, if you see yourself as exceptional, staying close to exceptional people will help you stand out. There's a saying, like seeks like, which explains why entire dormitories pass graduate exams or why some classes have multiple top achievers. It's the result of this principle. Discovering a great book or forming connections with highly accomplished individuals are two of life's greatest fortunes. The value of a person is largely determined by their circle of friends. The more outstanding your friends, the higher your own value and the greater the support for your endeavors. Friendships are a lifetime's treasure, offering support and encouragement that lead to constant victories and relentless progress. The magic of life lies in having someone to walk with. The beauty of existence is when giving roses leaves your hands fragrant. Life is such that to be near the intelligent, you must be intelligent. To be alongside the exceptional, you need to be exceptional. Without such companionship, life lacks luster, as do love, marriage, family, and career. 2. Never justify yourself. During the Eastern Jin Dynasty, Cao Fong held the position of inspector in Zhejiang province, serving as a judge for Zhang Tong. At that time, a military school student named Duan Hong Tian stole wood from the government to make household items. When Zhang Tong found out, he was furious and wanted to execute him. In a bid to save his life, Duan Hong Tian falsely claimed it was all Cao Fong's idea. Surprisingly, when Zhang Tong asked Chao Fong to verify this claim, Chao Fong took responsibility, thus sparing Duan Hong Tian from death. Zhang Tong then offered Chao Fong 10,000 strings of cash and a horse and dismissed him. Chao Fong silently left, never once defending himself against the false accusation. Later, Zhang Tong had to call Chao Fong back. Over a year later, a confidant of Zhang Tong revealed that Chao Fong had confessed to save another's life. Zhang Tong was astonished and subsequently treated Chao Fong with the utmost respect and generosity. 3. Discovering gold but refusing to claim it. Donating money to others is not a difficult task, but showing kindness to someone who is infringing upon your assets is a level of magnanimity not easily achieved by the average person. When Zhang Ji, while at Tai Hock, had his family send him ten tails of gold, his roommate took advantage of Zhang Ji's absence to open his luggage and steal the gold. The school authorities called in the roommate for a search. Upon finding the gold, Zhang Zhai declared, This is not my gold. The roommate, taking advantage of the night, returned the gold by hiding it in Zhang Ji's coat. Knowing his friend's financial struggles, Zhang Ji generously gave half of the gold to him. Elders say that giving gold to others is something anyone can do easily, but refusing to acknowledge the recovered gold in a critical moment, as Zhang Ji did, is a feat not easily accomplished by many. 4. Rehabilitating a Thief Vu Lengi, a resident of Taozhou, was originally a city dweller known for his integrity and kindness, never harming others for his own gain. In his later years, his family was quite well off. One night, a thief broke into his home, only to be caught by Vu's sons. The thief turned out to be a neighbor's son. Vu Lengi asked the thief, You've never been known to do wrong. Why resort to stealing now? The man replied, Poverty drove me to desperation. When Vu inquired what he needed, the thief said, Ten thousand coins would cover food, drink, and clothes. Vu Lengi handed the exact amount to the thief, who, upon leaving, was called back by Vu, fearing Vu had changed his mind to report him. Instead, Vu expressed concern for the thief's safety carrying so much money at night and let him stay until morning. 
Ashamed, the thief eventually reformed, becoming an upstanding citizen. Neighbors praised Vu Lingyi as a great benefactor. Moreover, Vu Lingyi supported education, establishing schools and inviting renowned teachers to lecture. His son and grandson, Vu Kiet Hiu, successively passed the imperial examinations, elevating their family status throughout southern Taozhou. This was seen as the karmic reward for Vu's commitment to. 5. Granting a Servant a Way Forward Truong Tehien, a famous general during the Northern Song Dynasty, was originally a right-hand man promoted to transport commissioner in the Jiangyan region. One day, he hosted a banquet at his home where a servant secretly stole several silver items and hid them on his person. Tehien, watching from behind a curtain, saw everything but remained silent. In his later years, Tehien became the prime minister and many of his servants were appointed to official positions, except for the one who had stolen the silver. This servant, seizing a moment of leisure, knelt before Tehien and lamented, I have served you the longest, yet while those who came after me have been honored with official titles, you have overlooked me. Overwhelmed with emotion, he could not stop crying. Tehien responded, I had no intention of mentioning it, but now you confront me. Do you recall stealing silver items in Jiang Yan? I have kept this secret for nearly 30 years, never telling a soul, not even you were aware. He continued, Now, as Prime Minister, responsible for appointing and dismissing officials, encouraging the virtuous and exposing the corrupt, how could I possibly recommend a thief for an official position? Out of respect for your long service, I will give you 300,000 coins. Take this money, find a peaceful place to live. Since I've revealed this past incident, you must feel ashamed and cannot stay here any longer. The servant was shocked, cried, and then respectfully took his leave. The ancient said, Giving way to others broadens your own path. Those who can adapt and yield, knowing when to advance and when to retreat, without engaging in conflict, often gain more than they lose in life. Being yielding does not mean losing or showing weakness, but rather it demonstrates respect, knowing when to step back. A step back opens up a world of possibilities. It's a form of character, a high level of wisdom, and a cultivation. Those who know when to concede are truly admirable. They know when to let go of their own opinions, perspectives, and personal interests at the right moment, paving the way for others. Letting go doesn't mean losing, it means winning the hearts of others. 6. Lessons on Pride in Eastern and Western Cultures Individuals with a prideful heart often rely on their perceived superiority, whether material or spiritual, placing themselves above others, sometimes without even realizing it. However, when this pride grows, it becomes dangerous. During the spring and autumn period, the state of Qi experienced a severe famine, leading to numerous deaths. A wealthy man, Qian Zhao, driven by goodwill, decided to cook and distribute rice to the poor. As days passed, people from various places came to receive his rice, expressing their gratitude and admiration for his generosity. This eventually led to Qian Zhao becoming overly proud, arrogant, and dismissive of others. One day, Qian Zhao encountered a man weakened by hunger and disdainfully offered him rice, saying, Hey you, come and eat. Unexpectedly, the man stared back at Qian Zhao and proudly responded, It is precisely because I refuse to accept rice from someone like you that I am in this state. Soon after, the man died of hunger. Qian Yao then regretted his actions, realizing that although his intentions were good, his arrogance had inadvertently hurt others' dignity, turning his good deeds into bad outcomes. Pride not only turns good intentions bad, but is also a fundamental reason for failure. The saying, 
Know yourself and your enemy and you will win every battle highlights this. Prideful people, centering themselves, underestimate those around them, including their adversaries. Historical losses like Hong Vu losing his empire and Quan Vu losing Jingzhou stem from such arrogance. Furthermore, pride can lead to dangerous prejudices, as it confines belief only to personal experiences and dismisses anything beyond. This narrow worldview, despite seeming enlightened, is akin to a frog in a well, oblivious to the vastness around. Both Western religions and Eastern philosophies contain stories of downfall due to pride. Lucifer, initially a perfect angel beside God, fell because of his pride, leading a rebellion in heaven and eventually becoming Satan. In Buddhism, Devadatta, despite being a cousin and follower of Buddha, let his arrogance lead him to commit grievous sins, aiming to usurp Buddha and ultimately falling into hell. These profound lessons show why both Eastern and Western traditions consider pride the root of many evils. Christianity identifies seven deadly sins with pride at the forefront, while Buddhism's Avatamsaka Sutra lists arrogance, jealousy, and lust as the greatest barriers to spiritual growth. Truly, authentic religions view pride as the genesis of sin. In conclusion, the Tao Te Ching teaches, the highest goodness resembles water. Just as water benefits all things without contention, a truly good person is like water, embracing all. The sea, accepting streams from all directions, becomes their king due to its lowliness, humility, kindness, and putting others first while eschewing arrogance bring respect and wisdom, allowing one to see the world clearly, understand the essence of things, and achieve unbeatable wisdom. 7. The Miracle after 100 acts of forbearance towards others, anything that people do is recorded and will surely be repaid with either good or bad fortune. The following story reminds us that enduring whatever comes our way can lead to everlasting happiness. In the Tang Dynasty, there was a man named Zhang Gong. Throughout his life, he could endure things that ordinary people couldn't. He vowed to withstand 100 extraordinary acts of tolerance in his lifetime, and he lived by this vow every day. Thus, he was known as Zhang Bai Ren, meaning 100 acts of patience. Zhang Bai Ren never argued with others when working with them. He was strict with himself, but generous towards others. Over many years, he had endured a total of 99 acts of extraordinary tolerance, and he was just one act away from fulfilling his vow. One day, Zhang Bai Ren's grandson got married, and he invited many friends to the wedding. They prepared a lavish feast for the guests. As noon approached, a beggar came by. Zhang Bai Ren said, Do not trouble him. Give him some food and let him go after he's eaten. The servant said the beggar wanted to come and sit with all the guests. Zhang Bai Ren found this request odd, but accepted it. Wearing a dirty, smelly monk's robe, the beggar entered the room, approached Zhang Bai Ren and said, Thank you for your generosity. Today is your grandson's wedding, and I specifically came to congratulate him. But I have another request, which is to dine with your most honored guests. Zhang Bai Ren hesitated for a moment, then agreed. He introduced the beggar to the master of ceremonies and then told everyone, Ladies and gentlemen, today is my grandson's wedding. I want to express my gratitude to all the guests for attending. This elderly gentleman just arrived and wants to sit and eat with us. Please be compassionate and make a seat available for him. At that moment, the beggar said, not just any seat with the ordinary guests, but with the most honored guests. Zhang Bai Ren asked, Why are you insisting on a seat among the honored guests? The seat I arrange for you is among important guests as well. Upon hearing this, the beggar said, Are you not a generous man? How can you discriminate between different people like that? 
Being well-dressed does not represent a good character, and being poorly dressed does not mean one is low in character. Why don't you reconsider before acting so hastily? What the beggar said truly touched Zhang Bai Ren's heart. He thought the beggar was right. He pondered, I vowed to endure one hundred unbearable things. Why should I let such a trivial matter bother me? Therefore, he immediately apologized to the beggar, then turned to all the guests and said, Please, for my sake, let the old man sit in the place of honor and do not worry about anything inappropriate he might say. Everyone at the wedding agreed to let the beggar sit in the place of honor. After the feast, all the guests left, but the old beggar remained seated without any sign of leaving. Zhang Bai Ren approached and asked, Old man, I believe you're full now and it's getting dark. What do you think if you stay here overnight? You can sleep with the cook in the kitchen. Would that be okay? The beggar replied, No. Even though I am a beggar, you should not let me sleep in the kitchen. You must find a decent place for me to sleep. Zhang Bai Ren said, All right, you can sleep in our living room. Right after that, the beggar said, No, I will not sleep in the living room. I think the bride's room is the most comfortable place in your house, so I will sleep there. Have your grandson sleep elsewhere. The statement from the beggar shocked everyone, and Zhang Bai Ren was about to explode. He said, Old man, I respect you for being elderly, and I have tried my best to accommodate your request, but I cannot understand why you would make such an indecent request. The beggar replied, I will just sleep there and do nothing else. Why are you so suspicious? I must say, you do not deserve the name Zhang Bai Ren. Change your name to Zhang Wu Ren, no patience. After hearing what the beggar said, Zhang Bai Ren did not know how to react. After a while, he told the beggar, All right, I will let you sleep in the bride's room, but I must ask the groom and bride first. Zhang Bai Ren talked with his family. His grandson said, No, this is an insult, absolutely not. Other family members agreed that the beggar's request was excessive. What if this news spreads? Our reputation will be ruined. Zhang Bai Ren tried to convince everyone. 8. Those with foresight and a broad perspective naturally possess great character. Visionary individuals undoubtedly possess a grand presence. It's not a big deal if someone has a low IQ or a low emotional quotient. What's crucial is to have a strong spirit. To put it bluntly, you may lack intelligence or social skills, but you must have a grand presence. If minor obstacles deter you or a few negative comments disturb you, if you harbor hatred or resentment towards others for no reason, then your character is too petty. The grander your spirit, the more success you'll achieve. Lam Tak Tu from the Qing Dynasty once said, the sea becomes vast by accommodating hundreds of thousands of rivers, and the towering mountains stand proudly without desires. A grand presence isn't inherent, but is cultivated through discipline and practice, embodying a powerful and resilient spirit. Such a spirit radiates elegance like the subtle fragrance of an orchid, steadfast integrity like bamboo, and resilience like plum blossoms in the harsh winter. Feng Mong Long in Tang Guangji Nang Bu wrote, Being tolerant and forgiving towards the petty reveals a noble character. A grand presence brings stability and grace, enabling one to navigate social interactions with ease and wisdom. Those with a grand spirit are not without desires. They see through life's facade, understand social nuances, know when to advance or retreat, empathize with others, and build good karma by helping themselves and others. Even in the face of immense sorrow, they can smile, not letting it affect their inner chi or spirit, always maintaining a fresh, nourishing atmosphere for their soul. 9. Act with humility. Strive not for contention, but for harmony. 
Hong Ying Ming during the Ming Dynasty once said, those who maintain harmony will naturally attract a hundred fortunes. Handling affairs in a harmonious manner, being a person who always promotes peace, avoiding wasting time on pointless arguments, reducing anger, will make you more likable and improve relationships. Naturally, things will go smoothly, leading to easier success. Mencia stated, The right moment is not as good as the advantage of the terrain, which is not as good as harmony among people. Harmony is about having a tolerant heart, a spirit of cooperation, an understanding of teamwork, and a peaceful atmosphere. Harmony is not just an external state, but also an internal cultivation. Only those with harmony can communicate effectively with others, collaborate well, and achieve career success. Harmonious individuals possess a profound virtue that supports all things. With good morals, any endeavor can succeed. Those who are harmonious know to forgive others with a generous heart, to let others take the credit for successes, to accept blame for failures, to be flexible. To have a heart that forgives the defeated, to care for the path of the successful, means to act with empathy and reason in all dealings, treating others with appropriate leniency. A harmonious person is warm, not superficial, loyal, not deceitful, granting kindness genuinely from the heart, not holding it inward nor boasting outwardly, not exploiting others for personal gain, always believing a noble heart remains calm, a petty heart is forever perturbed, upholding integrity and simplicity in conduct. Jeff. 10. Face challenges with determination, enduring hardship to nurture resilience. Facing adversity head-on and enduring hardships nourish one's spirit and resolve. Without a sense of direction, success remains elusive, but with determination, all is achievable. Confucius said, An army can survive without its general, but a man cannot live without a sense of purpose. Having a clear goal and pursuing it is what constitutes determination. The motivation that drives one forward without pause is spirit, and together they form resolute spirit. A person of weak resolve has not reached the pinnacle of wisdom. Every professional success is determined by this principle. When someone faces difficulties or humiliation, yet remains unwavering and steadfast, it reveals their resolute spirit. Those willing to endure suffering to fulfill their responsibilities will ultimately achieve great accomplishments. The historian Sima Qian demonstrated extreme patience, enduring suffering and humiliation to establish his legacy, leaving behind the renowned records of the grand historian for future generations. His mastery of endurance elevated the concept to its highest form. The agony and disgrace, the challenges of forbearance and the will to withstand humiliation laid the foundation for the creation of the magnificent records of the grand historian. 11. Spend your free time reading books and you'll exude the aura of a scholar. When you find yourself with free time, immerse yourself in reading and exude the essence of a scholar. This so-called scholarly demeanor refers to a kind of graceful poise and refined aura, an external manifestation of inner quality. A scholarly demeanor emerges from the clean air infused with the fragrance of books, capable of refining thoughts and, ultimately, actions. Those with a scholarly demeanor shine brighter with knowledge in their hearts, finding the study room a crucial space for nurturing this quality. In a study, books become companions and friends. Diving into a sea of literature and engaging with the enlightened expands one's wealth of knowledge. Thus, to cultivate a scholarly demeanor, one should frequent the study. Ancient wisdom tells us that practice is external, implying that to develop a scholarly demeanor, one must not confine oneself to the study, but also engage with the outside world. 
Keeping the company of the wise and immersing oneself in nature enriches one's experiences. The rich tapestry of social life acts as a great book in itself, urging one to step beyond the study, embrace the world's energy, and fill oneself with the pure essence of the universe. Tang Kwok Fien once said, A person's demeanor is innate and hard to change, except through reading. To maintain one's finest qualities consistently, it is crucial to foster a scholarly demeanor throughout life, allowing it to permeate the heart and resonate throughout one's surroundings, provoking continual reflection. A scholarly demeanor also has the trait of accumulating depth over time before manifesting gradually, and such depth is only achievable through sustained nurturing. Cultivating a scholarly attitude is not a matter of days, but a lifelong endeavor. 12. Don't sacrifice integrity for minor gains. In life, even if you lose everything, never compromise your integrity. The story below serves as a profound lesson for those contemplating trading their essence for fleeting advantages. In a southern town, there was a fish stall in the market with consistently long lines of customers, thriving unusually well because of its renowned freshness. The stall owner, a man over 50, once shared during a casual conversation that his business initially only provided enough to support his family, but it transformed thanks to a special customer. He recounted a story from about five years ago when a boy around seven or eight years old came to the market to buy vegetables and stopped at his fish stall. The boy asked for two flying fish. The stall owner glanced at the boy, scooped up two fish to weigh them. After rummaging through his pocket, the boy pulled out a 100 dong note. Is that a New Year's gift you're hesitant to spend? teased the stall owner. The boy's cheeks turned red. 36 dong, said the stall owner as he accepted the money, giving the boy 64 dong in change. The boy quickly took the fish and the change and hurried off. The next day, the boy returned saying, my mother was admitted to the hospital today. The stall owner was taken aback. She's sick and had surgery today. I bought her favorite flying fish yesterday because I was afraid she might never get the chance to eat it again. But after eating, she told me, it's truly not worth it to lose your integrity over a small gain. Embarrassed, the boy took out a brand new 100 dong note from his pocket and respectfully handed it to the stall owner, apologizing, I'm sorry, the money I used yesterday was counterfeit. This is real. The stall owner was astounded, not expecting such an outcome. He remembered how he hadn't suspected the honest-looking boy could have used counterfeit money. The boy, ashamed, said, Thank you, sir. My mother received this fake note earlier and always kept it in a drawer. Since she was sick and had used up all her savings, I wanted to save 100 dong by secretly taking this fake note to buy the fish. Thank you for not blaming me. The stall owner felt as if something had broken inside him, a feeling hard to describe. He took the counterfeit note out of the drawer and gave it back to the boy, who bowed and left. Watching the boy's fading figure, the stall owner couldn't regain his composure for a long time. Later, when cleaning up his stall and unseen by others, he disposed of all the fish treated with formalin that had been under his stall for over a week. Eventually, the boy's mother passed away from her illness, and the boy went back to his hometown to continue his studies. The fish stall owner never saw the boy again, but the memory of the boy and his mother, whom he had never met, always brought a warm feeling to his heart. The wisdom of that mother not only corrected her son back to the right moral path, educating him to be a good person, but also influenced others. Truly, she was a great mother. 13. In the end, what have we missed out on in our lives? What have we ultimately missed in our lives? Every opportunity that comes our way is a gift from above, even if it's just the chance to hear a single beautiful note of music. More importantly, 
We need keen eyes to recognize these precious moments so we don't let them pass us by. On a cold winter morning at a Washington subway station, a man took out his violin and began to play. He performed six pieces by Bach, with a worn hat placed in front of him on the ground for tips. To the hurried passers-by, he might have seemed just another anonymous street performer. After three minutes, a middle-aged man approached, listened for a few seconds, and hurried away. Four minutes later, the musician received his first few coins from a woman who dropped some dollars into his hat without stopping. Six minutes in, a young man leaned against the wall to listen, then glanced at his watch and left. Ten minutes after, a three-year-old boy stopped, fascinated by the musician, but his mother pulled him away. The boy lingered, looking back at the violin even as his mother dragged him onward. Other children also stopped, only to be pulled away by their parents. After 45 minutes, having played six songs out of 1,097 passers-by, only six stopped to listen for a while, and 20 gave money before continuing on their way. Unknown to the bystanders, the subway station's violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the world's greatest musicians. He played on a violin worth $3.5 million, performing some of the most exquisite music ever written. Joshua Bell's 45-minute subway performance, which garnered just $1.32, was part of a social experiment by the Washington Post concerning public taste and priority. Just two days earlier, Bell had sold out a theater in Boston where average tickets went for $1.200. This experiment concluded that even with one of the world's best musicians using the finest instrument, we struggle to pause even for a moment in our fast-paced lives, overlooking many meaningful experiences. It reflects our common perception that a great musician like Joshua Bell does not belong in a subway station just as we seek divine revelations in grandiose places rather than in the mundane around us. Lao Tzu, who served as the keeper of the archival scrolls in the state of Chu, was known for his wisdom across ages and the origins of ceremonial music, understanding the essence of morality. Yet only Confucius recognized his profound virtue. Confucius, after meeting Lao Tzu, expressed his awe, likening him to a dragon that harnesses the wind to soar to the heavens, a depth of wisdom immeasurable. Despite multiple visits to learn from Lao Tzu, it took Confucius time to grasp the great way, ultimately finding peace in enlightenment. To hear the way in the morning is to die content by evening. If Lao Tzu were among us today, as unassumingly as Joshua Bell in the subway, would we, like Confucius, possess the insight to recognize him? Or would we, preoccupied and hastening through our subway stations of life, pass by without seeing? What, after all, have we truly missed in our lives? 14. Are you okay? In interactions and dealings with others, a single sentence can warm someone's heart and make them feel at ease, while the opposite can harbor resentment for a lifetime. As a teacher deeply involved in education, I often advise the parents of my students that if their child accidentally breaks a dish or damages something, the first thing a parent should say is, Are you okay? Caring for and loving a child must take precedence over concern for material objects. After all, broken dishes can be replaced, but if we scold or punish our children harshly, it can damage the relationship permanently, like cracked glass that can never be fully repaired no matter how well it's glued back together. Taiwan's educational curriculum before 1990 included lessons on personal development, character building, and moral education. Textbooks often use stories about a Han Dynasty official named Liu Xuan to teach these lessons. One story recounts how, as Liu Xuan was dressed and ready to attend court, a servant accidentally spilled soup on his official attire. 
Contrary to the servant's fear of punishment, Liu Xuan remained calm and kindly asked, Did the soup burn you? Liu Xuan is a model of tolerance and generosity. Caring for others is forever the primary lesson in being human. Another time, while Liu Xuan was out with his ox cart, someone who had lost their ox insisted that Liu Xuan's ox was theirs. Without a word, Liu Xuan handed over his ox and walked home. When the person found their own ox, they rushed to return Liu Xuan's ox and apologized profusely. Liu Xuan helped them up, saying, Oxen generally look alike. It's easy to mistake one for another. You've gone to the trouble of returning it, which is commendable. There's no need for apologies. Liu Xuan truly embodies virtue and commands respect. I remember vividly in the early 1980s, during my first teaching job, I was holding a table tennis coaching session. I was blocking the balls and the students were taking turns hitting them. When it was Ka's turn, he swung hard but lost his grip, sending the racket flying into my forehead and breaking my glasses. Seeing the boy's pale, frozen face, I immediately went over, patted his shoulder, and said, It's okay. There's nothing to be afraid of. I picked up my broken glasses, the lenses shattered, and told the students, Let's continue playing. Honestly, I couldn't understand how I managed to remain so calm and forgiving. I thought to myself, I'm not usually like this. Undoubtedly, the historical stories of Liu Xuan had profoundly changed me. Being a teacher and imparting moral lessons to students also deeply ingrains those values in the teacher, helping to temper one's own nature. This is truly beneficial. In friendships, caring for each other should be more important than money. As parents, loving our children must outweigh our attachment to material possessions. This is the spirit of humanism guiding us in how to be better people. 15. I know that's enough for me. After a rain shower, a little boy discovered a small snail in the middle of the road. He sat down, gently picked it up, and placed it in the grass. Don't wander off too far, his grandmother called out to him. The boy looked up with his chubby face, excitedly saying, I'm rescuing the snail. It was in the middle of the road, which is very dangerous. I'm taking it home. His grandmother was puzzled. Does the snail know you're saving it? The boy answered, probably not. So doing this good deed goes unnoticed. Who will know you saved the snail? She asked. The boy quickly replied, knowing it myself is enough. Saving a snail makes me very happy. This simple statement from the child carries a profound philosophical meaning about human life. We do good deeds not for recognition from others, nor even for the knowledge of those we help. Knowing it ourselves is what truly matters. Doing good allows us to feel our own existence and affirm to ourselves that we are kind-hearted. This aligns with our expectations, thus enabling us to permit ourselves to do more good. That alone makes us feel happy. This is the greatest significance of doing good deeds representing our most primal desires. Unfortunately, in today's world, many people are overly pragmatic and self-interested, distorting their actions. We help others with the expectation of gratitude or some form of repayment, even if it's just a thank you, or we hope others will know about it thus earning their recognition and praise. If these expectations are not met, many of us are reluctant to do good. Indeed, letting others know about our good deeds has its place. But knowing ourselves that we have done good is what truly matters. After all, we live to witness our own lives, not for the validation of others. How much others appreciate and reward us is secondary to our own inner affirmation. The happiest person is the one who is genuinely satisfied with themselves. If the whole world praises you, but you feel inside that you have done many wrongs not worthy of praise, you will not find peace and happiness. Many philosophers believe that the world is full of illusions, 
and what's in our hearts is what's most real. This idea carries a deeply profound truth. 16. The Story of the Stolen Penny There's a tale about a woman with the last name Thee, who, 40 years ago in elementary school, was so hungry that she stole a penny from a classmate to buy a cake. Upon discovering her loss, the classmate cried and searched desperately for the money. This incident deeply imprinted on Mrs. Tai's memory, haunting her for years. After four decades of searching, Mrs. Tai finally found her old classmate. She approached her, offering $10,000, insisting, You must take this. I've been tormented by guilt for what I did back then. Interestingly, her classmate had long forgotten about the lost penny and wouldn't have remembered it if Mrs. Tai hadn't brought it up. In fact, no one else knew about this theft. Yet Mrs. Thee couldn't forget. Her conscience was troubled, gnawing at her as if she were being tortured. Determined to make amends, she sought out her friend to return the equivalent of thousands of times the stolen amount and to ask for forgiveness. It was only through this act that she felt liberated and at peace. Many people might have had similar experiences, feeling indebted to others for various reasons. The other party may not remember, and no one else might know or blame you, but you can't forget and forgive yourself. It's often said that one should not act against their conscience, precisely for this reason. A troubled conscience can lead to self-punishment out of a sense of guilt, a feeling just as painful as being reproached by others. Therefore, Mrs. T was willing to pay a large sum to compensate for a small debt, driven by a desire to settle her conscience. 17. The Shadow of Guilt there are mistakes made where those involved show no remorse, yet these errors indirectly affect their world. Once, while dining with a chef friend, he noticed something black in the food and cautiously fished it out. Although it turned out to be just a burnt piece of onion, he couldn't bring himself to eat any more of the dish. He candidly expressed, I find that nowadays many restaurants are dishonest, serving unclean food. That's why I usually avoid eating out, haunted by the fear of what might be in the food. His rationale was that since he personally wouldn't serve unclean food, he assumed others wouldn't either. Thus, a single burnt onion made him lose all appetite. If it weren't for that piece of onion, he wouldn't have enjoyed the meal as we did. This scenario mirrors many others. Your actions influence your worldview. Engaging in dubious activities, even if unnoticed by others and not directly penalized nor gnawing at your conscience, fosters a distrustful view of the world, indirectly disrupting your inner peace. We choose to do good not just for external praise or to avoid societal punishment, but because our actions profoundly impact ourselves. The greatest reward for doing good is the joy and contentment of our souls. Conversely, the heaviest penalty for wrongdoing is a troubled conscience and inner turmoil. 18. Let things come and go as they will. What comes will go following fate's lead. It's a universal truth that gains inevitably come with losses. The more you gain, the more you risk losing and vice versa in a fair exchange. Many dream of winning the lottery, yet life post-jackpot often doesn't meet expectations. A social study followed lottery winners over 10 years observing significant life changes. Most winners coming from working-class backgrounds hope their windfall would improve their lives. Instead, they face decline, reckless spending, borrowing by relatives, divorces, and moves, mostly deteriorating because they couldn't manage their finances effectively. Everything in life has its good and bad sides. Thus, a truly wise person understands that gaining is not always joyous and losing is not inherently sad. Facing any situation in life, one can embrace the philosophy of letting gains and losses follow their natural course, maintaining equanimity throughout. 19. 
contentment often leads to happiness. The discussion on the root of things contains a saying, those who covet will lament not acquiring jade despite having gold and resent not being a marquee despite being a count. This means that human hearts are limited, yet desires are boundless. People who have gold still desire jade, and those with a count's title still aspire for a marquise's. Sooner or later, those who seek beyond their means and fortune will eventually invite disaster. During the Ming Dynasty, Prince Ning of Jiangxi, Zhu Chen Hao, despite being of royal descent and living a life of luxury, was not content with just being a prince. He aspired to become the emperor. Unfortunately, his rebellion lasted only 43 days before being quelled by the governor of Nanjing, Wang Yangming, also known as Wang Shouren, and the Grand Secretary, Kai Ong. Ultimately, Prince Ning was captured and executed. Nian Geng Yao, 1480-1567, is listed in the Ming Dynasty historical records as one of the six major villains of the era. Nian Geng Yao and his son wielded their power to corrupt the world for 20 years, earning widespread resentment. Nian Geng Yao's son, Nian Shifan, was extremely arrogant and boastful, once loudly proclaiming, no one in the court is as rich as I am. Emperor Zheng De had long disapproved of Nian Geng Yao and his son, eventually finding a reason to strip them of their positions. Both were exiled to the frontier, and on the way, Nian Shifan fled to become a bandit and was decapitated by the court. With their family wealth confiscated, Nian Gen Yao had no home to return to and lived in disdain from others. Two years later, he died from illness. When Nian Gen Yao died, he was buried without a coffin and nobody was there to mourn him. There's a saying, a thousand room mansion still offers but two meters to sleep in at night and fertile fields stretching thousands of acres cannot provide more than three meals a day. So why can't people be content instead of tirelessly chasing after more? After all, no matter how much wealth or how high a position one might have, at the end of life, none of it holds any significance. 20. Achieving simplicity is not so simple. Achieving simplicity is truly difficult is a famous saying by Trin Ban Kyu, a renowned calligrapher and painter of the Qing dynasty. He once commented on this saying, being smart is hard, being simple-minded is hard. Transitioning from being smart to simple-minded is even harder. Let go, take a step back and your heart will find peace without expecting any rewards in return. Some say, in life, there are two things, being sober in work and being simple-minded in being a person. Simplicity is a state of mind and a level of cultivation. In the eyes of Confucius, simplicity was moderation. To the elderly, it was effortlessness. And to Zhuangzi, it was carefree. Many things are better left unknown, requiring no cleverness or deep understanding. In reality, Life is inherently simple. Joy and happiness are hidden within this simplicity. Once awakened, all joy and happiness may dissipate like mist. Living in this world, sometimes we just need to embrace a bit of simplicity, looking at life with a half-closed eye, which means forgiving ourselves and others. Those who are always calculating usually find life less enjoyable. Being simple with friends makes relationships last. Being simple with loved ones gives both parties freedom. Being simple with wealth brings neither pain nor resentment. Being simple in human relationships keeps the conscience clear. Being simple towards baseless rumors keeps the ears from tiring. Life's journey should be traversed with simplicity, living joyfully, knowing contentment often brings happiness. 21. Insight into life. Life, for us, is a journey. We cry upon entering this world, our tears announcing our arrival. 
yet those around us smile, their joy a warm welcome. As we grow, we find laughter in tears and tears in laughter. Some laugh more than they cry, filling their lives with light. Others cry more than they laugh, inevitably facing darkness. Everyone has a life, but not everyone understands its meaning. The key lies in how you choose to depict it. Be thankful for what you have and even for what you don't. Living another day is a blessing. Sometimes we cry over not having shoes, only to realize there are many without feet to wear them. Approach life with gratitude in every moment, and you'll find it richer and more beautiful. Buddha said, Arrival is by chance. Departure is certain. Be unchanging in the face of change and adapt as change comes. Cherish life, treat it well, and paint your own picture of it. Then, when you leave this world, you can do so with a smile because you've used your efforts to interpret and enrich life. So even as those around you weep, isn't their sorrow also a profound tribute to your life? 22. Insights on Life's Essence There's a profound saying, The truth of life is often hidden in the simplest and most ordinary things. People's lives are inherently filled with exhaustion, unavoidable ups and downs, and suffering. This is because we are mortals, experiencing the bitterness, spiciness, sourness, and sweetness of everyday life, and naturally, the vexations and sorrows that come with it. Whether it's bitter or sweet, life's events often don't go as planned, and who can insist on changing them? Learning to view problems from a different angle, changing our mindset, giving a little more, asking for a little less, and becoming more serene could make life somewhat more comfortable. Buddha said, If a person cannot feel suffering, he will not easily empathize with others. To learn to alleviate suffering, one must first experience it. Life is a challenging journey and a form of spiritual cultivation. Only by bravely facing reality can we overcome it, rise through falls, smile through tears, experience happiness in pain, and joy in misfortune. Learning to calmly accept, to bow your head and think, may reveal more of life's excellences in your journey. 23. Insights on Love Life is essentially a quest for love, where each person yearns to find four key figures. Firstly, oneself. Secondly, the one you love the most. Thirdly, the one who loves you the most. And finally, the one you spend your lifetime with. Loving and being loved are profound emotions. As we navigate through life, the complexities of fate and destiny are something no one can definitively articulate. Some people are destined to meet but not meant to be together, while others are bound by destiny yet lack connection. No one escapes the trials and tribulations of worldly life, hence the existence of romantic joys and woes, of unions and separations. When destiny favors you, learn to cherish. When it moves on, learn to let go. Only by doing so can we give others a chance to transform and afford ourselves more opportunities to choose. Don't let tears blind your vision or hatred consume your heart. In one's lifetime, at least once, you forget yourself for someone without seeking any results, companionship, possession, or even love in return, just hoping that at the most beautiful moment of life, you could meet that person. Whether it's a past or present life, if you have loved, have no regrets, so that one day when you and your loved one meet again, you can lightly say, Ah, you're here too. 24. Meals and Personal Cultivation Story 1. Xiao Ming accepted an invitation to a job interview at a large company. Throughout the interview process, he stood out remarkably and was invited by the CEO to a dinner party. At the party, he felt his behavior and manners were impeccable. However, the job was offered to someone else. Xiao Ming was infuriated, suspecting foul play. 
Eventually, the recruitment team informed him that while he was highly capable, the reason for his rejection was his lack of gratitude towards the service staff during the dinner, which was also a part of the interview process. Story 2 On the eve of Lunar New Year, Mai Mai's parents came to Beijing to celebrate with their daughter. Her boyfriend quickly arranged a dinner at a familiar restaurant. Despite his efforts to impress, Mai Mai's parents felt he didn't meet their standards for three reasons. He booked the restaurant without consulting Mai Mai or considering her parents' preferences. He was impatient and rude to the service staff during the restaurant's busy hours, and he took a lengthy phone call during the meal without excusing himself, leaving Mai Mai's parents feeling awkward. After hearing her parents' feedback, Mai Mai began to reconsider. Story 3 The way a man treats service staff before marriage reflects how he will treat his wife after marriage. This statement might seem extreme, but whether it's a business meal or a family dinner, how you treat service staff not only reflects your manners and cultivation, but also your emotional life. A psychologist once wrote, Constant criticism and nitpicking towards service staff can slow down the service even more. A person with a rich emotional life might say, Miss, you look so beautiful and efficient. Surely you can bring our dishes out a bit faster, right? Thank you so much. Story 4 What you bring to others at this moment is the ability to diffuse situations gently and comfortably. Consider others' feelings to ensure everyone is comfortable at the meal, Check if the food suits everyone's taste and if the seating is comfortable. A etiquette teacher once shared that her mother taught her to be thoughtful and coordinate with the guest's pace of eating, not to put down her chopsticks if the guest is still eating, as it might make them feel uneasy to continue. Subtlety and thoughtfulness are hidden in every detail. Manners and attitude during a meal, if handled well, even in small matters, can also bring good fortune. 25. The Tale of the Old Man Who Lost His Horse Near the borderlands there lived an elderly man who kept horses. One day, his prized horse ran off to the north and did not return. The neighbors, intending to offer their sympathies, were surprised to find the old man quite calm and without a hint of sorrow, saying, Who knows? Losing my horse might actually be a stroke of luck. A few days later, the horse unexpectedly returned, bringing several fine horses back with it, leaving everyone astounded. People came over to congratulate the old man, saying, What a blessing in disguise! Not only did you not lose your horse, but you also gained more. Everyone thought the old man would be overjoyed, but to their surprise, he simply said, Who knows? Gaining these horses might actually bring misfortune. The neighbors were genuinely puzzled but left without further questions. The old man's son, taken by the beauty of the new horses, decided to try riding them but unfortunately fell and broke his leg. Upon hearing the news, people rushed over to offer their comfort. As before, the old man remained unaffected and simply stated, Who knows? This might actually be a blessing. Later, when the imperial court conscripted young men to fight in a war, those who resisted were executed. Because the old man's son had broken his leg, he was exempted from conscription. At that moment, those with sons at war realized how fortunate the old man's family truly was. In summary, every event in this world intertwines fortune and misfortune. Therefore, it's best to live in harmony with nature not overly fixated on gains and losses. When pursuing goals, go with the flow of circumstances, do your best, and strive without attachment to the outcome. Success and failure are matters of fate. Often, joy comes from the journey, not the destination. Don't let victories or setbacks affect your peace of mind too deeply. 26. A Strong Start Water reaches its end as a waterfall, and at the brink of despair, people can find rebirth. When facing absolute despair, one should not hasten to give up. Just one more step might reveal a bright field of flowers, 
enduring a little longer might bring joyous scenery. A friend of mine said he was planning to write a novel about a bank robbery with a plot that seemed absurd and fantastical. I suggested, why not write a love story? I'd love to read a love story written by you. He replied, I've lost faith in love. How can I write a romance novel when love only brings despair? I responded, that's perfect. You're now in the right mindset to write a love story. We know many top comedians are very serious, even dull in their personal lives. They might not find life amusing, yet they can perform the funniest plays. There's a famous female director who is terrified of blood and darkness. Yet, the films she directs are so chilling that they make the audience shiver. The scenes she shoots are gruesomely violent. Did she close her eyes while filming them? Despair isn't necessarily bad. Sometimes, it's the turning point for a new life. A person who despairs in love must have experienced profound sorrow. A great writer's love stories are not just about love, but life and human experience. The desire for love motivates us to move beyond our past and pushes us forward. If we were immortal, would our love remain as intense? Destiny isn't just about random luck, but accepting and affirming the limitations within our finite lives. Choosing among these limitations is freedom. We are free to love and to despair. Love begins with fascination and often ends in despair. Those who have despaired might see things more clearly. O. Henry's short story, The Last Leaf, tells of a despairing patient who focuses on a leaf on a barren tree outside her window, battered by the wind. She decides that when the leaf falls, she will die. Day after day, she watches the leaf, waiting for her life to end with it. But the leaf doesn't fall, and she regains her health, only to discover the leaf was a painting by an old artist, giving her the strength to live on. The real lifesaver wasn't the leaf, but the firm belief in life it represented. This touching act by the silent artist, understanding her deepest fears, gave her the courage to continue living. 27. Aspiration and Tranquility Ancient wisdom tells us, Life and death are predestined, and wealth and honor are in the hands of the heavens. Everything in this life is already arranged. All follows the natural course of fate. We ourselves can do little to change this. The more we resist and desire, the less happiness we find. Only by following the natural order can we achieve inner peace. An employee once asked his colleague, You don't have more money than me, but I see you and your friends always seem so calm. Everyone is relaxed and not burdened by stress. Do you have a secret you can share? Moved by his sincerity, I smiled leisurely and replied, I don't harbor any desires in my heart. Can you do the same? Immediately, he appeared uncomfortable and exclaimed, How can I do that? These past few days have been exhausting. My son failed his math exam and I'm at a loss on what to do. I'm overwhelmed by credit card debt and have too many concerns to juggle, leading to even more troubles. Calmly, I told him, only when you stop desiring anything can you truly find peace. I shared a story about a wealthy merchant who encountered a beggar who claimed to be an old friend and asked for money. The merchant recognized the beggar as once wealthy and inquired why he had fallen so low. The beggar explained he lost everything in a fire and now needed money for alcohol, believing it gave him the courage to beg. This revelation helped the merchant see the truth behind many people's confusion in life. He reflected on how people are addicted to alcohol, women, and money, wasting their lives, and questioned why they live this way. He advised the beggar to seek him out when he decided to give up alcohol, the beggar felt dejected for not receiving money from an old friend. At that moment, a Taoist priest approached, and the beggar asked what tomorrow would bring. The priest, smiling, wondered why the beggar worried about tomorrow when he owned nothing. He explained that, as Taoists, they strive to be kind, 
patient and devoid of anger or desire, often going without food but still finding peace. After hearing this story, my colleague seemed to understand a bit and stated he would no longer worry about his problems. I suggested he try living with truth, goodness, and forbearance without resentment, complaints, or hatred gradually learning to let go of desires. I hoped he too could find tranquility. Reflecting on this deeply, I realized that only those who are compassionate, honest, and patient can achieve peace. When the mind is free of desires, one can see life's truth and live contentedly. In this world, money and status are deemed essential, but when we pass, we cannot take them with us. Despite our efforts to secure these things, they ultimately mean nothing. Furthermore, according to the law of karma, a person's achievements and status are the result of their virtues accumulated from past lives. Why some are born into favorable circumstances while others face difficulties is a matter of destiny. People often work hard their entire lives seeking a peaceful retirement. Yet, we constantly seek tranquility externally, forgetting that it's something we can all achieve by simply letting go, pursuing less, and following the natural order. Happiness is within your grasp. 28. Distant as the horizon, yet close, right before your eyes. Happiness is often closer than it seems, right in front of our eyes. The most precious form of happiness is sometimes the easiest for us to overlook. Having a home to return to, someone waiting for us, and three meals a day to eat. A writer once said, what is happiness? Happiness is when everything continues as usual. In essence, the simplest joys can be found in someone waving goodbye in the morning and waiting to welcome us back in the evening. Imagine tucking a backpack into a corner before heading out or stuffing smelly soccer shoes under the table. These are the details we often overlook. Yet, reflecting on this seemingly mundane yet peaceful life, we might regret not cherishing these moments if taken for granted. There's a touching story that goes like this. A puppy asked its mother, Mom, where does happiness lie? The mother replied, Happiness is on your tail. The puppy then tried to catch its tail to see what happiness was like, but quickly realized it couldn't catch it no matter how hard it tried, only managing to run in circles until it became dizzy. Sharing its concerns with its mother, the mother smiled and said, Don't try to catch your tail. Just keep moving forward, and happiness will always follow you. This story teaches us that we are often amidst happiness without even realizing it. Happiness can be as simple as knowing where to go after leaving work, knowing a light will be on for us at night, or knowing a hearty meal awaits when we're hungry. In essence, the most valuable happiness we often overlook is having a home to return to, someone waiting for us, and meals to eat. Someone once said, If you miss a bus, there's always another one. If you run out of money, you can always make more. If you lose a job, you can find another. But home and family are irreplaceable. Happiness is what we search for throughout our lives, yet it is profoundly simple. It's about the daily, unassuming moments we share with our loved ones. Home is both the beginning and the end of a person's journey, a sanctuary for both body and soul. After experiencing everything the world has to offer and returning to a normal life, one realizes happiness is indeed that simple. It's about having a warm home filled with loved ones, sharing meals together, experiencing the seasons, and living each day in simple contentment without change. Life is fleeting, and through this simple story, may you cherish the happiness you have, and for those who have yet to appreciate it, may you recognize and hold on to the happiness before it slips away with time. 29. Heaven favors the virtuous. The Tao Te Ching includes the phrase, The way of heaven is impartial. It always sides with the good people, 
meaning that the heavenly path does not favor anyone in particular, but grants blessings to those who are virtuous. The way of heaven is impartial, because the way of heaven extends everywhere. There is no place it does not cover, no place it does not encompass, treating all things in the world equally. It always sides with the good people because those who are virtuous create blessings for all beings and bring grace upon themselves, naturally earning heaven's favor. The way of heaven treats us all equally fair. Thus, whether one can become a person of goodness entirely depends on oneself. How you act will determine your destiny. The quality of your inner character will decide the breadth of your perspective. 30. Keep a kind heart. Keep a heart full of good intentions. Don't let greed for wealth dictate your actions towards others, nor allow personal gains to cause harm. Avoid deceit and manipulation, and do not seek to oppress others. Embrace simplicity without ulterior motives. Be kind instead of malevolent, and remain honest rather than deceitful. Show respect and dutifulness towards your parents, sincerity towards your friends, cherish your partner and be enthusiastic with your colleagues. Treat everyone around you with kindness, show concern for those close to you, and in all actions, ensure there's a path forward for both yourself and others. When giving to others, do so with compassion, when rewarding, with humanity. A cheerful spirit always attracts fortune and blessings. Just by maintaining a benevolent mindset and speaking gently, you can create positive connections with others. 31. Those who do good deeds may not immediately see their rewards, but they have already distanced themselves from misfortune. Good deeds can set the stage for future blessings, even if they are not immediately apparent. As Zhuangzi once said, if a person harbors good intentions in their heart, even if fortune has not yet arrived, misfortune has already departed far away. Throughout our lives, we pursue good fortune and happiness, with some turning to prayer or religious rituals, hoping for divine intervention. However, the true source of blessings lies not in external forces or others, but in our own actions and moral conduct. A story recorded in The Words of the World illustrates this point beautifully. In ancient times, in the east of the city of Wuxi, lived a couple, Lu and Ngak. They had a single son named Shi, who, at the age of three or four, was kidnapped by human traffickers while attending a lantern festival. Despite searching the city far and wide, the couple couldn't find their son, and were forced to borrow money from a wealthy family to continue their search. Their journey was fraught with high mountains, deep waters, and limited funds, compelling Lu to engage in small trades along the way to earn travel money, enduring immense hardships. One day, Lu found a green cloth bag containing 200 silver tails. Despite his poverty, Lu knew he couldn't rightfully claim the money and waited for its owner, who, upon retrieving it, was immensely grateful and insisted on inviting Lu to his home for a lavish meal and offering him money as a token of thanks. Lu refused the money, but the grateful owner, admiring Lu's integrity, offered his daughter in marriage to Lu's son to establish a family connection. Moved by the mention of his missing son, Lu shared the story of his search. The man, empathetic to Lu's plight, offered to give Lu a servant boy to raise as his own. Fatefully, this servant boy turned out to be Xi. The story ends happily, with Ji marrying the man's daughter and their offspring achieving great success. This tale exemplifies how good intentions and actions not only bring blessings to oneself, but also prosperity to one's family, even benefiting future generations. It embodies the idea that good people are blessed and the sincere find luck. With goodness in one's heart, divine protection is assured and with sincerity, blessings naturally follow. 32. Your appearance reflects your personality. Your appearance speaks volumes about your personality. It's a common experience in life. 
Someone might initially seem exceptionally refined at first glance, but over time, they appear more average. Conversely, someone might seem quite ordinary at first, but grow more appealing and interesting the more you look. This phenomenon largely stems from the fact that a person's facial expressions can reflect their temperament, and in turn, their temperament influences their appearance. A person's character is fully expressed through their face. As depicted in Dream of the Red Chamber, Lin Dai Yu, who is frequently sorrowful and sickly, is described as having eyebrows light as smoke, seemingly knitted yet not, embodying a delicate spring-like beauty that is intelligent and agile, with an elegant demeanor that hints at the ethereal. Over time, personality can indeed alter one's appearance. Ancient wisdom tells us, the face is formed by the heart's intentions, suggesting that one's appearance changes according to their thoughts and feelings. A generous person exudes tranquility. A friendly person naturally smiles more. Simplicity shows an innocence reminiscent of joyful childhood. Deceit is betrayed by uncertainty in the eyes. Boldness is often marked by furrowed brows. The mental state of a person, if positively transformed, not only invigorates the body, making it robust, confident, and not just altering the appearance, but also enhancing one's aura. If you desire beauty, nourish a bright spirit, for only inner radiance can sustain lasting grace. 33. Your appearance reflects your life. We often say that judging a book by its cover is superficial. However, Sometimes appearances can indeed be revealing. This appearance isn't just about looks, but also encompasses demeanor, eye contact, speech, gestures, and aura. A person's quality of life, whether good or bad, can often be discerned through their appearance. There was once a survey on the correlation between salary and attractiveness, revealing that individuals who are considered attractive tend to earn about 15% more than the average person. This doesn't imply that merely being physically appealing will earn someone's favor. Most attractive individuals also possess numerous virtues. Behind an attractive woman often lies a more refined lifestyle. Selective eating, proper rest, a habit of reading, and consistent exercise. Your appearance is indeed the manifestation of your lifestyle. While natural beauty is a gift, having an appearance that brings comfort and ease to others requires self-discipline and maintenance. Each of us has a responsibility toward our own appearance. 34. Your appearance is a reflection of your experiences. It's been said, if God blesses you with a beautiful face, you must tread carefully as it's a test of your character. If your character is mediocre, this mediocrity will manifest on your face, transforming beauty into vulgarity. Many may have read the story of Miss Kwok Uyen Dawn, born into a distinguished family but who also faced unstable days worrying about the next meal and was even sent to work in agricultural fields in her youth. No matter the hardships, she meticulously maintained her grace and poise. In her old age, Kwak Uyen Doan remained a refined and elegant lady. Tran Dan Yen recounts meeting her, describing her as stunningly beautiful at 86, with snow-white hair, wearing a sky-blue fur coat, and still radiating beauty. Accompanied by three young women, they appeared not as three women and a lady, but as three men with a beautiful woman, highlighting her enduring charm and grace. This demeanor comes from enduring hardships, embracing life's challenges, and over time, cultivating a calm and elegant temperament that shapes one's appearance. True beauty is not merely superficial. It's forged daily, distinguishable even in a crowd, and reflects the soul's essence. British writer Russell once said, a person's face is their outward value. It not only conceals their life, but also harbors the life they seek. 
A person's appearance relates not only to their present, but also determines their future. However, believe that appearances can change. Therefore, be genuinely kind, optimistic, filled with love and gratitude. Enrich your soul, cultivate a positive outlook, and refine your sensibilities. Such a person will inevitably become increasingly beautiful. 35. True Happiness The greatest tragedy in life is living amidst happiness without realizing it, constantly seeking fulfillment externally, leading to exhaustion and dissatisfaction. It's only upon losing it that one truly understands how happy they were. A few days ago, I had a casual conversation with a friend who shared a story about her mother. Coming from a relatively affluent family with a 100-square-meter home, her mother was never satisfied, always envying others' mansions, perpetually discontent, and complaining to her family. She believed a life of luxury required living like others. Her son, in an effort to fulfill his mother's dream of owning a mansion, invested all his resources into a business that ultimately failed, leading to financial troubles and the sale of their home to pay off debts. They ended up living in a tiny 10-square-meter house. This is a prime example of not realizing the happiness one has until it's gone, showing how daunting human desires can be. This reminds me of the story of the grateful goldfish. The fish, wanting to repay the old fisherman who saved its life, granted all his wishes. The fisherman's wife wanted a new wooden tub, then a large house, and her wishes were granted. However, she was not satisfied and wanted to become a noble lady, then a queen, yet still wanted more. Eventually, the goldfish stopped caring, and their lives returned to how they were at the beginning. This story illustrates the endless nature of human desires. One day I stumbled upon a saying online, Life is inherently happy. It's just that people never feel it's enough. If carrying burdens is suffering, then doing nothing is happiness. If walking is suffering, then riding a donkey is happiness. If being cold and hungry is suffering, then being warm and fed is happiness. This is indeed true. Only those who feel content can find happiness, a widely agreed-upon perspective. Yet how many can truly live by it? I also came across the story, The Poor Man and the Angel, where a poor man, living in a cramped house with four generations, constantly struggled. He prayed to an angel for relief. The angel appeared and instructed him to bring chickens and ducks into his house to live with him for a week. After a week of hardship, the man prayed again, and the angel told him to remove the animals and return after another week. Feeling immensely grateful, the man thanked the angel, realizing he was now truly happy. Many of us are like the poor man, complaining about life's injustices, believing others have it better. In reality, happiness is often right beside us, unnoticed. The angel in the story didn't give the poor man anything new, but helped him realize that he should focus on what he has, not on what he lacks. It's not that life is unfair. It's that our desires are too great, blinding us to the happiness we already possess. It's when things don't go our way that we reminisce about the past, recognizing that contentment with what we had was true happiness. We shouldn't constantly seek happiness elsewhere while ignoring the joy in our current lives. Walk your path. Enjoy your life. Time is never wasted. It helps us recognize the value of what we've lost, teaching us to cherish our present lives more. 36. The Fisherman and the Golden Fish Returning home, the fisherman was astounded to find that the castle and palace had all vanished. In front of him stood only the dilapidated hut of old with his wife sitting by the broken pig trough. This is the conclusion of the fairy tale, The Fisherman and the Golden Fish, a story familiar to many of us from childhood. It teaches us a lesson that those with insatiable greed who desire more upon receiving ultimately end up with nothing 
returning to their original state of having nothing. However, this tale holds deeper life lessons that, upon closer reflection, reveal more about human nature and desires. The story begins with a poor fisherman who catches a golden fish. Out of pity for the fish's pleas, he releases it back into the sea. The golden fish, being magical, promises to grant the fisherman any wish. Initially, the fisherman says he needs nothing, but his wife, upon hearing the story, demands a new pig trough to replace their old, broken one. The golden fish fulfills this request. Yet, the wife's dissatisfaction grows. She then demands a large house in place of their shabby hut, and the fish agrees. Her demands escalate to becoming a noblewoman, and then a queen, which the fish also grants. As queen, she becomes cruel and harsh towards the fisherman, treating him like a servant without any resistance from him. Unsatisfied, she then wishes to become the sea goddess, ruler of the vast oceans, demanding the golden fish serve her. This time, when the fisherman presents her demand, the golden fish disappears without a word. Returning home, he finds everything gone, including the new pig trough and his wife back to her original peasant self, no longer a queen. The story reflects the impossibility of satisfying human desires through divine intervention. Many often question, if gods truly exist, why don't they make countries wealthy and people happy? The answer lies within the tale. Human greed is bottomless. What defines wealth and development? Like the fisherman's wife, who initially only wanted a new pig trough, desires grow with each fulfillment, leading to an endless cycle of wanting more. Consider this. Can gods continuously meet such unreasonable human demands? In religion, the concept of karma teaches that happiness and wealth come from doing good deeds and serving others, not from demanding favors from the divine. The gods encourage people to abandon desire, cultivate morality, and embrace goodness, as taught in religious texts. Why would they then satisfy human greed, which only leads to further moral decay? Was the fisherman truly innocent? While he was kind-hearted and not self-serving, contrasting with his greedy and deceitful wife, his release of the golden fish brought him more trouble than fortune eventually returning his life to its original state. This raises questions about fairness and gratitude. The fisherman, despite his good nature, made the mistake of enabling greed and evil. His attitude towards his wife was not one of forbearance but of weakness and cowardice, failing to distinguish right from wrong. His passive acceptance of her unreasonable demands facilitated her greed and cruelty ultimately leading to their downfall. The golden fish's disappearance without fulfilling the wife's final wish serves as a punishment for her greed and the fisherman's failure to stand up against wrongdoing. The story suggests that the world suffers not because of evil people, but because of the silence of the good. By remaining silent and fearful in the face of evil, one becomes complicit. The tale underscores the importance of speaking out against wrongdoing to prevent the spread of evil and harm to others. 37. Why are you angry? Once, during a dispute between her son-in-law and daughter, where the son-in-law was exceptionally aggressive and uncontrolled, a typical person might have intervened on their daughter's behalf, defending her against the son-in-law. However, she approached the situation objectively, identifying the root cause of the argument without taking sides. She comforted her daughter while also educating her son-in-law, pointing out her daughter's shortcomings with goodwill. Eventually, her daughter recognized her faults and reconciled with her husband, preventing an unwarranted divorce. When her son was scammed out of money while working far from home and found no one to turn to for help, she advised him to suffer the loss for a greater good and even gave him a little money to start over. Her husband was hot-tempered and often harsh towards her, but she never took it to heart, 
always telling others that he was a good man at heart, just with a sharp tongue. Some might consider such tolerance foolish, but from another perspective, everyone faces annoyances in life, and anger and conflict only add to one's suffering without changing the situation. Only those with a generous spirit and who do not dwell on loss or gain can skillfully navigate through conflicts and turn misfortune into fortune. Ancient wisdom encapsulated in the proverb, a broad and forgiving heart can steer the ship of life, suggests that without a great capacity for patience and a generous heart, one cannot be a leader or accomplish great things. A grateful person and a resentful person will lead very different lives. When encountering others, the grateful person appreciates their virtues while the resentful person focuses on their flaws. When receiving kindness, the grateful person is moved to tears while the resentful person feels it's never enough. When accepting an apology, the grateful person forgives generously while the resentful person harbors deep anger. When offered help, the grateful person is touched and remembers the kindness, whereas the resentful one complains about the lack of thoroughness. When receiving advice, the grateful person thanks the giver for their good intentions, while the resentful one suspects ulterior motives. Externally, everyone lives in different circumstances. However, internally, everyone lives within their own mental world. When embracing the compassionate teachings of Buddhism aimed at liberating all beings, the grateful person uses every challenge as an opportunity for continuous growth, whereas the resentful person keeps blaming others, thus deepening their negative karma and falling further into despair. A grateful person with a loyal and honest heart is like quality material that can be shaped into any form, beneficial and adaptable. In contrast, a resentful person harboring deceit and rebellion, even as a semi-finished product, is inadequate, often resulting in failure and waste. 38. The Essence of Maturity What is maturity? Is it silver hair, weathered skin, or the lines around the eyes? No, it's none of these. Physical changes are merely the marks of time. True maturity is invisible to the eye. It might resemble a ripe peach, soft, fragrant, and sweet. We often believe that with age comes wisdom, but that's not necessarily true. Maturity is like revisiting life cycles with each passing year, achieving tranquility after unmet desires, smiling through tears after suffering, and an inner drive to rise above defeat. True maturity has never been about age or time. It lies in the serenity and balance of the soul. Maturity is like the moon shining through clouds, a dragon soaring through a storm, being at peace with the earth and sky, similar to a kunpeng fish that rides the wind high into the heavens. During the Northern Song Dynasty, there was a great poet named Su Shi, who, despite facing life's tumults, maintained his composure and joy in adversity. Su Shi was forthright and honest, demoted for criticizing the salt tax policy of Wang Anxi, and sent to Huangzhou. In Huangzhou, living in a simple room by the river with neither money nor food, Su Shi had to till the fields himself. Yet, faced with life's hardships, Su Shi never lost his dignity. He refused to let money endanger him. He lived happily in his small riverside home. In Huangzhou, Su Shi led a simple life, engaging in reading, poetry, painting, calligraphy, farming, and appreciating the countryside. Despite the prolonged exile, he grew fond of this remote land, devoting his time to poetry and painting. His spirit has been admired by generations. 39. Maturity is a realm of its own. If the process of growing up is likened to trees flowering, then maturity resembles the fruition process. From being tender shoots to when the flower buds blossom, each tree undergoes a period of growth and development. However, not every flower will bear fruit, 
Just as not every individual who grows older necessarily becomes mature and wise. Maturity is a state of being, akin to becoming one's own beacon of light even when the skies are dark. Surrounded by fog and unable to see the path ahead, a mature person understands the need to slow down, to calm the mind, and to refine oneself amid adversities, quietly waiting for the opportune moment amidst tumultuous seas. Mature individuals recognize that everyone is born with a purpose. They are aware that each person is more complex than what appears on the surface, and that everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. With maturity comes the understanding that living requires one to be forgiving of oneself and others, even extending forgiveness to one's enemies. The sea is great because it accepts a hundred rivers. Its greatness comes from its capacity to forgive. Forgiving others' faults is, in essence, liberating oneself. Life is fleeting like a gust of wind turning black hair to white in an instant. A mature heart does not dwell on temporary gains or losses. The stronger the wind, the calmer the heart. The heavier the rain, the firmer the will. 40. Maturity isn't about age. It's about what's inside. Age is just a number, a superficial measure, while maturity is about the depth of one's character. A mature person possesses a soul of immense calm. Maturity is like a river that swells silently at night, calm on the surface but gathering immense strength within, capable of cleansing everything in its path. If each person has an aura, then the most mature among us radiate a white light, bright but not blinding, dazzling yet not ostentatious, vibrant without causing a stir. A mature heart is like water gentle yet resilient, letting joys and sorrows flow through without leaving a mark. Maturity isn't measured by years lived, but by an inner peace and stillness, standing unshaken amidst the whirlwind of life's changes, weathering storms and winds with the steadiness of a mountain. Maturity, or being well-rounded, is a personal requirement and refinement, it's an exploration and reflection on oneself and a state of being in life. On the journey towards maturity, everyone will face many challenges but also learn a great deal. No matter how long and thorny the path may be, each step that makes us more mature is a success in itself. 41. Forgetting the kindness you've extended to others. There's an old saying that goes, Give without expecting anything in return. If you expect something in return, don't give at all. However, in life, there are some who, after lending a helping hand, feel that the recipient owes them a debt of gratitude. They obsess over the need for acknowledgement and repayment, often adopting a haughty demeanor and showing disrespect when face-to-face -face with the person they've helped. A few instances might be tolerable, but repeated behavior like this can become irritating to those who have been significantly helped, making them uncomfortable. This, in turn, leads the helper to feel unappreciated and betrayed, regretting their kindness, resulting in disappointment, frustration, and even resentment, which only adds to their distress and misery. Helping others should inherently be a positive action, but constantly keeping score turns it into a burden, making it difficult for one to live joyfully and at ease. Everyone will, at some point, find themselves in need of assistance, so it's beneficial to remember the help we've received from others more than the help we've given. By doing so, we can lighten our own lives significantly. 42. Letting go of resentment. In life, we encounter many people and go through numerous experiences, some of which may cause us to become infuriated or deeply resentful and even feel shackled, affecting our ability to enjoy meals or sleep well. When someone harbors resentment, they are essentially imprisoning their heart in a cage. Their gaze constantly fixates on the object of their resentment, leading them to act unconsciously against that person, gradually straying further from their true selves. 
Holding onto discomfort is akin to a painful scar that flares up with each memory. The more we cling to it, the harder it is to heal. Therefore, in life, don't hesitate to be more forgiving and forget past grievances and anger towards others. Letting go is the ultimate form of liberation. Once we manage to release these burdens, we may find that the warm sunlight, long unseen, finally breaks through the darkness to shine brightly upon us. 43. Don't dwell on past glories. It's said that dwelling on a glorious past is the biggest obstacle to future success. Everyone has a past, and many have had their moments of triumph, but after all, that's all in the past. Yet in life, many fail to grasp this, choosing instead to define their present lives by their past achievements. They look at others whose past may not seem as bright as theirs, yet find them faring much better today and feel unjustly left behind. They question how someone who was once less fortunate can now be doing so well. As others steadily move forward, they live in the past, believing themselves to be smarter yet falling further behind, leading to a stagnating life. Those immersed in their past successes, unwilling to let go, will find themselves believing they are genuinely talented but simply born at the wrong time, thinking life has deliberately put obstacles in their path. This breeds resentment and dissatisfaction, clouding their view of everything around them. Yesterday cannot stay, nor can past glories. If one can move beyond the allure of the past, they won't halt their progress, harbor dissatisfaction with life, and instead, step by step, they'll move towards a truly beautiful future. 44. Please learn to forget. If we look around at the people in our lives, we might notice that those with exceptional memories often lead less comfortable lives. These individuals tend to carry a heavy load in their hearts, holding on to numerous people and events, thus trapping themselves in a cycle of struggle and suffering. Life is far too short, with little time to spare for pain and wastage. Why not be someone with a slightly forgetful mind? There's no need to let past people and events become chains around our hearts. Life requires moving forward, letting go of others, the past, and even ourselves. 45. Let everything flow smoothly like water. Water, an element without a fixed shape, moves easily along the path of least resistance. Yet, Ancient wisdom suggests that even mountains cannot resist water's flow, which can erode stone over time. The ancients believed that behaving with flexibility and going with the flow, like water, would lead to smooth progress and fulfillment of desires. This concept is encapsulated in the principle of not competing. Not competing is different from a lack of ambition. By avoiding competition, one respects the natural law, maintaining the balance of all things, avoiding sacrificing the greater for the lesser, and not losing oneself amidst constant changes. Actions should not be hasty, as haste does not bring success. Before undertaking any task, it is wise to carefully consider, plan, and then proceed cautiously, step by step, much like how water flows gently without urgency. Moreover, just as a small stream can grow into a mighty river over time, those aspiring to greatness must learn humility and cultivate an attitude of not competing to eventually rise. 46. Reality shifts with the heart. Happiness or sorrow is a matter of personal choice. Life belongs to each individual, and ultimately, how we live, it is up to us. No one can prevent you from being at ease, nor can anyone stop you from living freely. Likewise, no one can limit your happiness. Buddhism teaches a valuable lesson. Seek not outside yourself, or outside the mind there is no dharma. Thus, joy is in the heart, freedom is in the heart, and happiness is also found within the heart. 
In life, there may be times when we find ourselves in situations beyond our control, forced to do things we wish we didn't have to. But who can restrict what's inside your heart? Only you can decide what's inside. Some people can live happily in any situation, while others cannot. This shows that when the mind is at peace, everything else will be too. Even in adverse conditions, one can still be cheerful and relaxed without having to seek a different path. There are those who never seem satisfied, constantly chasing desires and competing, only to find their goals becoming ever more distant. Such individuals might achieve great success, but often they find little joy in it. All emotions, joy or sorrow, are determined by oneself, not by external circumstances. For example, a woman who does not covet jewels and riches will not be swayed by them, even if they are piled up right in front of her. A poor scholar would rather cherish thousands of books than trade them for millions of diamonds. Those content with a simple life in the countryside will not envy anything like academic honors or high official positions. The more serene life is, the more radiant the soul becomes. There's no need for ostentation. True peace lies in a calm inner self. Happiness is the peace of the body and the tranquility of the soul. The well-being and beauty of the body represent worldly happiness, while the serenity and harmony within the soul are akin to the ultimate bliss of nirvana. 47. Big and Small Do you truly understand yourself? A friend once told me about a visit to a relative, an aunt who had never in her life worn a pair of shoes that fit. She always chose shoes that were too big. When asked why, she said, big or small, shoes cost the same, so why not get the bigger size? Whenever I share this story, it always gets a hearty laugh. Yet, in life, we often encounter many such aunts. For instance, people who aren't writers publishing lengthy, bitter works, those who aren't artists creating one monumental painting after another. Many chase grandeur, driven by greed like buying shoes too large, forgetting their true size. Whether buying shoes or pursuing goals, finding the right fit is most crucial, and moderation is the smartest approach. 48. The Sound of a Ticking Watch one day, a father accidentally misplaced his wristwatch. Frustrated, he searched everywhere to no avail, despite looking for an entire morning. When he stepped outside, his child quietly entered the room and found it in no time. The father asked, How did you manage to find it? The child replied, I just sat quietly, and after a while, I could hear a faint ticking sound, and that's how I found it. Moral the more desperately we search for something, the harder it seems to find. Only by calming down can we hear the sounds in the depths of our hearts. 49. Do not do to others what you would not want done to yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In the Analects, Wei Ling Gong, there's a story where Tzu Kung asks, is there one word that can serve as a principle for life? Confucius replies, perhaps it's reciprocity. What you do not wish for yourself, do not do to others. To become a person of gentleness, you need only follow two practices. First is calm forgiveness. In face of others' mistakes and shortcomings, we must maintain tolerance and calmness, be strict with ourselves, patient with others, and not unreasonable acting cautiously, knowing that forgiving others is also forgiving oneself. The second is empathetic consideration. Do not impose on others what you would not desire for yourself. Before acting, first consider the perspective of the other party. Seek a balance of interests and employ the most suitable methods to achieve mutually beneficial outcomes, making everyone feel at ease. This way, you can avoid putting yourself in awkward situations, smooth over most relationships, remain fearless regardless of the situation, and maintain a warm and refined image. 
Such individuals are often the fastest and most stable in advancing their careers. Beyond the workplace, in family and daily life, they excel at resolving conflicts adeptly and gracefully, making others feel like a breath of spring air whenever they're around. 50. Open your heart an inch and the road widens by a yard. A heart wide open makes the road ahead much broader. There's a saying, a heart wide open makes the road ahead much broader. If you're forgiving, able to let go of things that seem unforgivable, you'll also avoid harboring bitterness. A truly cultivated person uses compassion and tolerance to lift others up, which in turn elevates themselves. Life isn't always smooth sailing. So when we can't change reality, we must strive to adjust our mindset. If your heart is filled with grievances, you'll only find resentment wherever you go. But if you let go, you'll always feel as serene as spring. If you keep things simple, the world can't become complicated. If you are the sunlight, it's hard for others to feel hurt. 51. If others don't hesitate to speak up, why should you hesitate to say no? There are people who, when seeking help, make direct requests without considering whether it might inconvenience or embarrass you. They think only of their own feelings, assuming it's only natural for you to help, and if you don't, they see it as almost a crime. Your assistance is expected and refusal is seen as cold and uncaring. They fail to realize that in life, no one owes anyone anything. Therefore, helping you is a kindness, and not helping is not wrong. A few days ago, I received a call from Tung, whom I hadn't spoken to in a long time, and his first words were, Is the Evdex store related to your family? A friend of mine is visiting today. Give us a discount, okay? His tone didn't sound like he was asking for a favor. It was more like an order. Reluctantly, I called my relatives to arrange a satisfactory deal, then informed Tung. Right after I finished speaking, he hung up without even a word of thanks. I felt incredibly annoyed and angry at myself for being too polite to refuse, not just because of the financial loss, but more so because I didn't even receive a word of thanks. People who don't appreciate help will eventually take others' assistance for granted, and your politeness only encourages their endless greed. With such individuals, you don't need to weigh the emotional aspects. You need to be decisive in refusing, firmly saying no. 52. Being overly polite is essentially dying of embarrassment for the sake of pride. Being overly polite can sometimes lead to humiliation due to concern for appearances. There are individuals who claim to have a good relationship with you and seek your assistance for themselves or their family members when needed. Out of a sense of obligation, you might reluctantly agree, only to find that they take advantage of your generosity, turning you into a useful tool for their benefit. They parade around boasting of their close relationship with you, claiming it enables them to resolve many issues without any cost. But each time you help, there's so much you wish to express, but refrain from doing so. Such was the case with Nam. At the time, I was in charge of the sales department, and he bought a car with my assistance. I felt I couldn't refuse. But soon after, he brought in family members, colleagues, and even acquaintances to buy cars, pushing the boundaries of our relationship. They all haggled aggressively, invoking our personal connection, making me wish I could just give away a car to end the ordeal. Despite my forced smiles, I had to carefully consider each interaction. Ironically, Nam didn't realize the inconvenience he caused me even bragging about how he was helping my business and expecting me to treat him to meals as a thank you. I was utterly speechless. The situation worsened when Nam brought in a friend to buy a car, and I couldn't meet his unreasonable demands. This led to a rift between us, as if I were a traitor to our relationship. Our once strong friendship was gradually destroyed by my unwillingness to keep bending over backwards, and the bond we shared became increasingly strained. 
53. Turning someone down isn't wrong. Don't let politeness harm you. In college, I befriended someone and we had a good relationship. Once this friend mentioned their mother was ill and needed to borrow money. Unable to refuse and genuinely wanting to help, even as a financially struggling student, I gave them money meant for my own living expenses to aid their mother. Helping a friend in need was the right thing, but it felt wrong to ask for the money back once things settled, all because of politeness and reluctance, creating unnecessary hardship for myself. Consequently, without daring to tell my parents about lending out my living expenses, I faced severe financial constraints, meticulously calculating every meal, leading to a drastic decline in my quality of life. It was then I truly understood how financial generosity could backfire. Half a year passed with no mention of repayment. I saw her several times and wanted to ask, but hesitated out of awkwardness, eventually losing the chance altogether. It's often said that problems solvable with money aren't real problems, but it seems money can also test the sincerity of relationships. Lynn once mentioned there are many ways to destroy relationships, but lending money can be a tempest that uproots them. How many conflicts have started simply because we were too hesitant to refuse a loan? 54. Is spiritual practice necessary in seclusion? Kazuo Inamori, one of Japan's four most famous entrepreneurs, once said, Work itself is a form of spiritual practice, and the workplace is your arena for spiritual development. Every task presents an opportunity for spiritual growth. Spiritual practice at work isn't about sitting upright and chanting scriptures or trying to appear knowledgeable. It's an act that emerges from a strong inner force. Work holds significant value and profound meaning for everyone. Labor can help us overcome desires, temper our character, and cultivate our personality. Its purpose goes beyond merely fulfilling life's necessities. That's just a secondary benefit it offers. Therefore, pouring your entire spirit into your daily tasks is crucial. Only then can you achieve the highest level of spiritual development in refining your soul and improving your character. Buddha Gautama emphasized that diligence is paramount, a key method to reach enlightenment. Diligence means putting effort into your work, focusing your mind on the task at hand. It involves actively tapping into your inherent potential, enhancing personal growth, and elevating your level of professionalism. Thus, concentrating your spirit on a single task, maintaining a diligent attitude towards work, and consistently striving every day will refine your soul and deepen your character. An old saying goes, Achievements in work are not as valuable as becoming someone who knows how to work well. Labor is worthy of reverence. This is the principle. To love a job wholeheartedly, one must invest themselves fully in it. Character is cultivated through work, meaning philosophy is born out of sweat and tears, and character must be tempered through daily labor, focusing entirely on the tasks at hand, continually brainstorming and striving, will make you appreciate every moment of life. Life is once, and every day should be lived with utmost seriousness, without a hint of waste, living earnestly to the extreme. This seemingly naive life attitude, if maintained over time, can transform anyone ordinary into someone extraordinary. Those who've achieved fame globally or led in their fields likely followed this path. Labor not only generates economic value, but can also contribute to humanity's value. So, why should people seek solitude away from the mundane world? The workplace is the best environment for mental discipline. Work is a form of spiritual practice. By truly dedicating oneself to daily work, cultivating a noble character, a fulfilling life can be easily attained. This world only lacks people with ambition, not tasks without prospects. There was a carpenter over 60 who told his boss he wanted to retire to enjoy life with his family. His boss, 
reluctant to let him go, finally accepted after persistent requests. Before leaving, the carpenter was asked to build one last house. He agreed, but his heart wasn't in it anymore. The quality of his work dropped. His professional pride faded. Upon completion, the boss handed him the keys, saying, This is your house, my gift to you. Shocked, the carpenter realized the last house he built, carelessly, was his own. It showed that maintaining professional pride is crucial till the end. Maintaining professional dignity is easy for a while but rare throughout one's career. It demands perfection in everything we do. Ultimately, what you become isn't decided by the cards you're dealt by fate but how you play them. The key to playing life's hand well is to elevate your professional spirit and passion, especially in today's competitive era, to cultivate a strong, energetic inner self. Life isn't about pleasure, but a serious endeavor. We all aspire to be ambitious, but facing certain situations, we might not know where to start. Perhaps revisiting the life philosophies you've long understood, serving as nutritional factors for a healthy mindset, is needed. People must be eternally vigilant in life. Some live for work, others for dreams, some continue searching for their life's purpose. Being born grants us rights, but living requires our wisdom and courage. Only by starting can we achieve our ideals and goals. Only through effort can we seize brilliant success. Only by sowing can we reap. Only by pursuing can we experience what it means to live honorably. Only by dedicating ourselves to learning, focusing on work, practicing spirituality in our tasks, tempering our professional spirit, actively changing our attitude, and unleashing ever stronger life energy can we attain a serene and healthy life. 55. Don't show off being smarter than others. Many people have the bad habit of interrupting others before they have a chance to finish their sentences or express their thoughts fully. They often believe themselves to be smarter or more understanding than everyone else. Imagine a scenario like this. A group of friends gathers around to listen to one of them excitedly share an intriguing story. Everyone is listening intently, completely engrossed. Suddenly, someone else joins in without knowing the full context and hijacks the mic to blurt out the story's ending. As a result, those who were listening intently are disappointed and the storyteller's enjoyment is spoiled. For the person who interrupted, it's unlikely anyone will hold them in high regard. The book Tai Can Dam states, To speak ten sentences, nine of which are correct, might not be surprising, but to say one wrong sentence can lead to a cascade of faults. Essentially, think of it like a soccer goalkeeper. Saving nine out of ten shots might not earn praise, but letting just one goal through can be enough to be seen as the culprit. Even if you understand something, it doesn't mean you have to speak out. If you have thoughts that seem inappropriate, it's better not to express them. In many cases, it's preferable to keep your thoughts to yourself. Interrupting not only causes the other person to lose goodwill towards you, but sometimes it can also lead to unnecessary misunderstandings. Imagine a young man genuinely fond of a girl but too shy to confess his feelings. Unexpectedly, one day the girl approaches him and confesses, I like you. The young man, overjoyed and relieved, starts to say, You are a good girl. But before he can finish, the girl interrupts, Okay, I know. You don't need to say it. The young man, embarrassed, stammers, I, I. The girl turns away coldly, saying, No need to say more. Goodbye. The young man intended to say, I like you too. But because of his embarrassment, he couldn't get the words out in time. And the girl, too hasty and interrupting, never got to hear the affectionate words that were meant for her. Many awkward, laughable situations and unnecessary misunderstandings arise from the habit of not patiently listening to someone finish speaking. 
Those who do not interrupt others also show humility, not flaunting their supposed superiority, and thus avoid making assumptions about others' thoughts. Refraining from interrupting is the most basic form of social etiquette and the highest expression of personal cultivation. 56. Respecting Others Often there is a pressing urge to voice our thoughts, a certain discomfort in holding them back. Expressing our opinions can bring immense satisfaction. Yet this pleasure must be founded on a bedrock of respect for others. Articulating our thoughts in a way that doesn't discomfort or trouble someone is a subtle art. Nature gave us two ears and just one mouth for a reason, to encourage us to speak less and listen more. To truly listen, one must let go of their ego, fully empathize with the other person, and genuinely care about what they have to say. Listening is challenging precisely because it requires such empathy. Everyone has the right to express themselves, but in many cases, restraining one's words can be far more beneficial than a relentless stream of talk. In a small American town, a young boy once tried to jump high enough to reach the moon. Curious, his mother asked, What are you doing? Excitedly pointing at the bright moon, he exclaimed, I'm going to jump all the way up there. His mother was startled but remained silent listening to his imaginative journey into the sky. After he finished, she smiled, ruffled his hair, and said, That's great, but remember to come back for dinner. Years later, Neil Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon. He was that boy. What was once a playful tale became reality. If his mother had dismissed his fanciful story in anger or interruption, would the world still have had the great Armstrong? The book... Dialogue on the Root of Words says, The mouth is the door of the heart. Those who speak in anger lose more the more they speak. Cultivated individuals always make room for others in their hearts, never interrupting but listening and understanding instead. A good listener doesn't need to do much. Just sitting there, attentively listening, can enrich the soul. Heaven grants each person an equal share of fortune. Some dissipate their blessings quickly through anger, while others preserve their good fortune throughout their lives by nurturing a calm demeanor. The better a person's temperament, the greater their fortune. Viewing the world with a kind heart and treating others with goodwill can naturally increase one's virtues and blessings.